2020 is in the rear view mirror, y'all, and that means the countdown is on. Yeah, buddy, here it comes, elk season 2021. What, what's that you say? Is still a ways away? Oh, heck no. You can get that stuff out of your head right now, Boudreaux. Not our grinders. But what do you do between now and September, October, or November? That's going to mean the difference between punching your tag or spending another year talking about those woulda, coulda, shouldas. Listen, I'm going to say this real slow and real clear. You want to increase your chances to be successful next fall? Then that journey starts today. But don't worry. You're not on your own in this stuff. The coaches are in the house and preseason has begun. Welcome to our next blue collar elk hunting series, Elk Preseason Guide. In it to win it. So y'all buckle up. Tonight is part one. We start with some preseason focus areas and tips to help you increase your odds in your favor for the upcoming seasons. Those topics along with our Elk Bros shout outs and letters from our Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, happy new year and pull up a chair and adjust your volumes just right. And welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by elkgrows.com with your host, Gilbert Ornelas and elk hunting coach, Joe Gillian. You want to hunt elk? They live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hi. Hello there, everyone. Happy New Year. If this is your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from Katy, Texas, Luis Gonzalez, and from the say, DFW area. <laughs> <laughs> and from the DFW area, Manano Grateron. And your elk hunting coaches are in the house tonight uh, from Cimarron, New Mexico, Leroy, Chad Chavez, and the one and only a WWJGD. What would oh, Joe man. Gillia do in the house? Hola. What's going on, fellas? He really likes to get you uncomfortable with that, doesn't he, Joe? He sure he gets yeah, he sure does. It, though. Oh, uh, Joe's got the editing JD. button, so I, yeah, I usually end up editing that stuff out to you. So uh, um, Happy New Year, Happy fellas. New Year, brothers. Happy New Year, everybody. Feliz Happy New Year. Año. The Feliz beginning año. season. Three man, can you believe that? Wow. Season three, baby. season three, wow, unfreaking believable, episode man. Episode one hundred and one, yeah. <laughs> episode one hundred and one, one hundred and one, man, one hundred and one. Now that means we're at the basics now. One hundred and one, there we yeah. are. Yeah, one hundred and one. Here, here and, we and start. That actually works perfect for where we're <laughs> starting out right now, Every man. No doubt. Oh, but guys, you know, I don't know if you, if our listeners heard it when gilbert did the introductions he did them a little bit different because it was and from katie luis gonzalez and, from, <laughs> and, and luis the jury's right. still out joe yeah, right oh man so i want everybody to know we need to have a runoff election still for the <laughs> leader of the Venezuela Mafia, oh but there's God. a problem. You should avoid any other riot. Uh, <laughs> see what happened today. <laughs> see what happened today. Yeah. <laughs> but, I but got yeah, people. What's but, the problem, Joe? The problem is the two candidates, <laughs> man, the top two candidates that came out of our little vote, they were both Frenchies. It was Coco and Juju. Man, I, those were my favorite voters, dude. I've got I, I got the advantage just because of those two voters, bro. The cutest voters of them all. You know what's so funny is the first time I saw those dogs was when Scott Baker did that uh, did the piece for our shout outs and I don't know if you guys noticed, but they, they have the dogs sitting around them. Yep. And all you, all you can hear is 
<laughs> he's got he's holding a bone man and that dog is just ripping at that bo- like gilbert said like a dog on a bone right <laughs> Heck yeah like a rat on a cheeto boy <laughs> <laughs> oh i thought it was hilarious man so that was a lot of fun having that um there you know we found out a lot of things doing that number one manano never shows up on on social to be able to, and 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 luis is going to <laughs> Find He's anybody can to run his campaign, social. right? Hey man, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, you know. Yeah, when you know you're gonna guy. lose, you're not interested. You're not so I mean, PR you don't even genius. run for it. So I mean, <laughs> no. that's normal. <laughs> uh, and, and and then you, I also found out that one sign that a campaign manager has can go a long way because I kept seeing votes from people with the exact same sign. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, different Thanks, votes. Logan. Different yeah. votes. <laughs> <laughs> different boats and and then we had dogs voting i'm like yeah, we had what? pets voting joe i was like yeah. what kind of election is this next man? time we'll have dead people voting we had we had, <laughs> we had kids that sign was even running around in different cars around the city and stuff oh like yeah that, man. absolutely Crazy, man with the Luis that, team that yeah. was a lot of fun hey man, man guys no bs aside the mafia is here to stay uh, <laughs> we coined them a long time ago I told these guys they were going to be a mainstay in America households. I mean that 100%. I have the utmost confidence in these fellows. They're two of my best friends, brothers to the end, bad to the bone. Uh, I can't wait to see what the future has for the mafia. Um, but I can guarantee you this. It won't be dull. I can tell you that. Because <laughs> if it is, big O's coming. <laughs> they, they wanted to make sure they were a mainstay in every home, so now they're, they're, they're doing carpets. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> it's a, it's a job, epic. bro. It's a job. It's a job. <laughs> My load is heavy. Uh, you know, hey, look, it's going to be fun. It, these guys, have they have shown up to put the work in. Um, it's fun to have them around. Um, you know, like I said, it was kind of ha-ha, I coined it before, and then I went. Mm, I, something is something is with this, oh, this it's, is, everything and, right is going to happen with this and, uh, in Joe fact and our I first just, our first video came out uh yeah. the first half of our video the blue collar strong and and it's titled the mafia boys because they yeah, came right. out and <clears throat> it came out slamming i mean <laughs> oh, it's uh, showed up number one this is what's so cool <clears throat> showed up number one Neither one of them were really all that enamored with their equipment, okay? Because <laughs> they got new bows, new arrows, new <laughs> stuff that we're figuring that out in elk camp. I'm like, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. The boys show up and they are unprepared, especially my brother, Luis, who fancies himself yeah. the leader, right? He shows up and he is like, you know, oh my gosh, I... I got to show y'all this. Look at this here. I got a new show. I mean, what, maybe four days before coming to camp? I mean, it's Hey, like- man, I got, I got excuses left and right that I'm not going to bring up because mm-hmm. uh, we know how excuses go. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I can like explain bones. why. I was stink. not fully I- unprepared. I just was not as prepared because I had a few curveballs. Uh, at the thinking, last minute for I'm which thinking, I had thank really God, had to, I'm thinking, thank God he got a 12-yard and a 12-yard shot, both yeah, of them, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it didn't matter. It could have been like, which pin? Which All pin? of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you remember hearing what both of them said, you know, yeah, the, the yeah. First, oh, I think I hit him high, and the other one, I think I hit him too far back. And I'm like, what the heck is this all about? Yeah. Right? Like, hey, That's come true. on. It wouldn't That's be true. the same. It wouldn't be the same without a dadgum struggle. Oh, but then again, wait a second. I think I remember hearing a third shooter going, I think I hit him high. I think I remember that one, too. Oh, yeah, no, I did think I hit him high. When you're shooting downhill, you for sure think you hit him high. I wasn't lying. I did hit him high, but I hit him high just right. Uh, yeah, just right. Uh, just right. Because I had to because of the angle he had. Exactly. So I, I will be the first one to say my first shot. I shot low. <laughs> so <laughs> was the total miss, bro. No, Even yeah. worse. No, 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 no. Let's, let's let's clarify this. Let's clarify this. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. I killed that long. Aim. Killed it's, the it's hell a, out of that long. It's a it's a learning moment, right? You we're just measuring distance. No, right. no, no. I'm just saying. <laughs> I always aim mid body, right, to give myself three four inches up, three four inches down, right. 
And that log happened to be exactly mid-body. So when I went four inches down, it would have been golden triangle, buddy. Joe Luke. Would have, would have, should have, could have. The exact same things we're yeah. going to be talking about hey, today. Hey, Y'all hey. stay tuned. Joe Luke, I'm going to just get it out of the way. The first day, we're just both going to shoot a tree because the two years in a row, you shot a tree, you killed a bull right after. So we'll just let you shoot trees from now on, Joe. You know? hey, but they dead, bro. They dead. <laughs> Man, all in fun, guys, for sure. Mean, I, <laughs> Can't wait to see what the mafia's got in store. We've oh, been yeah. killing it in South Texas. These boys have been killing it up in North Texas. Uh, there's a whole lot of content fixing to come at you guys. Um, Master Logan, uh, my young son, oh, has been laying it, laying the wood to them hogs and deer in South Texas. It's been a lot of fun to get him, uh, you know, camera double a and triple a here been doing a lot of work i tell you what man uh, in, in the future of elk bros people are going to be hearing about that boy because uh, oh yeah man, i tell you what an assassin very man. near future yeah <laughs> and lacy man if we get lacy out there because lacy is that, that girl is deadly lethal so yeah I mean, nothing stays alive long when they're in there i mm -hmm. tell you the ornellis crew knows how to finish mm -hmm. that's all i got to, to the say bone. they know how to and finish to the bone man. Oh, but I got to give a shout out too to uh, my buddy Lance Bernal. You guys remember Lance? He was mm -hmm. on one of our first you know, super game biologist, great guide, top notch hunter. And the thing about Lance, man, he's just a super, super person. But now we can add something to the list. He's he's also a film critic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet Ryan, we caught I bet we caught a lot of good stuff and a lot of uh, that had to do with to do the this. with the horns and the antlers. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw that comment. Uh, he goes, he goes, man, I really like that, but Joe. They're and, uh, antlers, man. Antlers. <laughs> yeah. I can't Duly get, noted, uh, Mr. I Biologist. By, man. So, Lance, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I need to do some, maybe some changing in all your biology books, and maybe we won't have to worry about this no more. You know, it's 40 years for me, Joe, calling them horns. It doesn't matter, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's been tough to get to the <laughs> antler part. Uh, we even say horns down there on the whitetail range, so... Uh, yeah. And they're not. They're antlers, you they're know, antlers. for sure. Yeah, I guess so, man. But <clears throat> I don't know. You know, it's just one of those things. You've been when you've been horn hunting your whole life, and yes. you know, so it's just just one you of those you. things, man. Backwoods, I guess. I, I I'm a slow learner, Lance. We'll get there. Oh, uh, during the time while we were gone, in between our last one and now, we had our giveaway. We had our hundredth episode giveaway, and that was just tremendous very honor. successful yeah and and now that we're over with the holidays guys be patient we're now uh, you're going to hear this um we're, remember we're recording a weekend so a lot of this stuff in this next seven to ten days should be getting shipped out so if you were a winner um those accounts for base camp are going to start happening and you're going to we're going to start shipping out equipment uh i'm contacting people that are you know, given uh, those products away that have to ship them. If you don't get uh, your items by the 20th of January, you email me directly, joe at elkbros.com. But, y'all, we had $1,400 worth of products from our sponsors that we gave away in seven days. And and I got to thank Blackhound Optics. Amen. Outdoor Edge. Oh, yeah. Tracy Henry with the custom made knife, man. I That's mean, an awesome knife. It, oh, unbelievable. And, uh, uh, and we're going to talk more about Tracy sometime, you know, uh, he's just a wonderful human being. Bendable products, um, and bendable, look, Black Hound, Outdoor Edge, Outdoor Edge, we are the, that is our official Elk Bros knife right there, Outdoors Edge. Amen. Edge. So um, Bendable Products, who now we're carrying their products in our store, as well as um, Game Changer Calls, Phelps Game Call Sense stuff, Got Game Tech. Uh, that would be the Elk Nut app. Those guys uh, are just tremendous, <laughs> man. Paul and, and Taylor, those guys just are, are they're just super with us. Hit or miss archery out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Our hometown archery store, man. Uh, That's cool. I, I can't say enough about 
hit or miss as well. Just tremendous people. Uh, they've got an incredible indoor facility that if you want to shoot, you know, Chav and I have visited there. They were real supportive of Chav during uh, his fight, and they continue to be supportive. When I, you know, when I went up there and said, you know, we're doing this, they were like, man, we'll get away two dozen arrows. And I was like, whoa, that's that's cool, man. Yeah. So, uh, and, oh, here's something that I got to make sure I say is thanks to one of our giveaway winners, y'all, we're going to have another giveaway here in the next few weeks and that one however is only going and I got to figure out the details of how to make this work but it's only going to be for our veterans or first responders and the reason that is is that one of our giveaway <coughs> winners um, listens a lot to the things that we talk about and, and what are going on and, and with people that have done some fantastic things and he wanted to step up he wanted to help try to make the world a better place with one gesture at a time and he he donated all his stuff and then to make the pot sweeter goes to the elk bro store and buys gear to include in it as well um, wow. so that we can do another giveaway for a vet or a first responder man so that's um, sweet yeah that's awesome man that's, that's incredible gorgeous. thank you Big time. yeah thank joe you very can much. you tell us about any of the new products in our store Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, we just had a competition on uh, on IG, on Instagram, uh, selecting one of our designs. we got new T-shirts going to be coming out. But we are also, guys, our goal, our goal at Elk Bros is to always bring quality gear to you guys at a grinder value. And, and what I mean by that is, and I don't want you to get confused. I don't want you to think you're getting a value product. You're mm -hmm. getting a great product at a great value. And that's our goal. If mm -hmm. we can get discounts on it um, for you, like, for example, you can go to, uh, you can use our Elk Bros 20 for base map. You can uh, use our Elk Bros uh, 30. Um, I'm trying to, let's see. We've got that Elk Bros 30 going on as well for one of our products. Uh, I think that's Outdoor Edge, man. You can use Elk Bros. Yeah, Outdoor Edge, Elk yeah, Bros 30. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Use that as a discount code. You're going to get 30% right. off. And we are actually Black Hound dealers right now um, so that not only can you purchase those rifle scopes at the manufacturer suggested retail price, below that you get another additional 5% <laughs> off buying it in our store. So, and, man, th I'm just... You guys have got a couple that you're going to be doing some reviews on. Yes. Um, I'm anxious to, to hear what so those reviews are I'm, like. So I'm, I'm willing to real quick talk about the Outdoor Edge hook, uh, gut hook. Uh-huh. And I tried it on a pig um, at the end of December, just this December, and it, it works like a charm, man. Oh it's a God. dream. Amazing. So sharp. It just felt like it was gliding from the moment I made the cut in the two uh, top back legs. Mm -hmm. When I brought that thing down all the way, it just felt like like nothing, like butter. butter. Unbelievable. So, yeah, and it's so cool because it's so large and it gives you that nice grip. And you, you don't have those those finger holes that you right. have to put in and try to jerk it down no man this this and, and you don't have to worry about a knife blade being in the way either so no yeah and it's and easily replaceable and then now you got the other longer knife you know to actually get after it after yeah, i think you, is going to give it. us do us another little review of those so that we can, <laughs> uh, so we can yeah yeah of right? course i yeah. i Without Tomas. <laughs> Without Tomas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was, I was, everything was under control. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, what? no, I, I tried this uh, weekend. Oh, with okay, the, with cool. The, I'm, I'm ready for the... it, man, when you are. And, oh, also, so the other products that we're carrying in our store, we have Game Changer Calls. Um, if you haven't seen the Game Changer, man, I tell you what, uh, when it comes to adding back pressure to either, you know, mute a call or make a call sound a little louder out of a small form factor, it is unbelievable. And Bendable Products has some of the most unique, cool things out there for diaphragm calls, for grunt tube, grunt tube holders. It's just... I was going to say, uh, uh, Joe, that little uh, holder clip for the vice of the of the hat, is that from the them as well? Quiver. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. yeah. 
Gotta try and, one of those. And that, that mm -hmm. reed quiver that snaps onto your hat that keeps it right there, I mean, it's just right there so that you can grab it. You're not going to lose it. That's and, pretty cool. You know, there's so many people going, why? <laughs> why? Had, I mean, that's such a great idea. Why hasn't somebody thought of that? Yeah, already? I know. And it's so simple, too. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are ball caps that have like a little pocket on the side of the brim. Uh -huh. The turkey hunters have it now where they got it on the side of the brim. Oh, I see. Where you can, yeah. put, your, where you can put your little diaphragm in there. But my, I've got one of them, and they fall out all the time when you bend over. So oh. it ain't cool. I bet that, that clip's a lot better. Oh, heck yeah. It don't go nowhere, man. Yeah. In fact, I, I have that puppy right here on my hat right now. <clears throat> and and if you're – it does not matter. Oh, yeah. wow. You know? Cool. And then so you need it, you just grab it, and it's off. And you just set That's it right cool. back inside there, man. You just it, Just like that, it's not going nowhere. No matter what That's happens. That's neat, man. So, mm -hmm. look, look at that. You need to give me one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. They're, they're going to be available in the Elk Pro store, man. So <laughs> Coming there to you, you soon. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's fantastic, guys. I, and I will have the Black Hound scope mounted on the 300 Ultra, and I'll give you all a little review. We'll do some uh, we'll do some video at the shooting range with it and everything and show you how easy it is to sight in uh, the whole nine yards. We'll get all that to Joe and get him uploaded on a, on a product review for, for the Black Hound Optics. They, you know, the scope is unbelie unbelievable as far as quality oh, and man. clearness. Uh, when you're looking through the optics. So that's all the, that, I tell you what, that is the one thing, because these guys, this is not their first rodeo. This company used to produce all of the other branded scopes. So in other words, you know how Cabela's will have people produce things and they stick Cabela's yeah. on it. Yeah. So um, yeah. because of certain disclosures that they can't put out yet until those contracts are done, they used to produce scopes for major scope companies companies so they could put their name on it this I mean, you is can tell not the quality. their first rodeo man you can tell the qualities are uh, fantastic yeah and i told you that review they had on the safari magazine spoke to just about that man and, sure. and and look the reticles the reticles on these cool. on the sites are awesome and they're lit yeah I mean, they're yeah. just illuminated reticles that's uh, not just cool lit but actually <laughs> lit so, yeah exactly so everybody out there listening um you you know that <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not going to be doing a review on one of the, the scopes because I don't own a gun. And I was like, and the reason I went with this company was, and I, I have had a lot of conversations with the owner, just a tremendous guy, man. And uh, their whole attitude about what they're trying to do to make optics affordable, but they but not be a cheap yeah. Thing. They, they, they want to put quality out there at, at, a, at a price that is affordable for people to have great optics. And, you know, um, Vortex did the same uh, thing when they came out like that. Yeah. And, and I got news for you. I, I have a feeling Vortex is not going to like Blackhound because this company <laughs> has the right idea. They got the right marketing scheme so that they don't jack up prices from place to place. So I'm um, super excited for when they come out with binoculars too, Joe. I heard oh, you man. the grapevine that that was a... Yeah. That's, that was something that they're looking at. So yep, I, that's really cool. That's what I'm waiting for because I, I want to see that happen. But I, yeah. I wish them all the best, and I like what they're trying to do to help hunters. So that, to me, is one reason that, that I'm proud to, to work with them. It's all about that, you, you know. Betcha. So pretty cool. Guys, y'all know what time it is. Shout it's out. time for shout Bro Bro out. Shout Outs. Shout out. Guys, shout if you're new out. to our show, this is just a shout out to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week. That's right. And new for this season, Grinders. Are you listening here, Lake Stevens? I hope so, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still got to find out what the heck is going on in Lake Stevens. They, they, they are now Chicago saw Lake Stevens coming up close and in chicago it, i feel like i'm watching a drag race here man because <laughs> chicago's like oh lake steven's getting close and man <laughs> they started speeding up getting the the listens in man it's kind of cool but i they're in that fourth position man getting ready to take it from chicago um but for this season you can be part of our special shout outs all you have to do i we want you uh, your video of you on our shout outs. We're going to put whoever sends them in on week to week. If we have to cut down our, our the, ours that we do, if we get a whole bunch of them, we will do that, except for the top listening. You just We just want to make sure that we get <coughs> listeners in there. So um, all you have to do is take your cell phone and take a 10 to 15 second video of yourself. Make sure that it's in 
landscape mode, not up and down like Instagram does, in landscape mode like you're watching this right now. Do a 10 to 15 second video of yourself. Tell us your name, where you're from. Include um, a home of the whatever line or something special about your hometown. And then all you have to do is email me, Joe, and it's, that's J-O-E, <laughs> at elkbros.com. And just email me that you have a clip that you want to put a shout out on the show, and I'm going to send you a link to my Dropbox, and all you got to do is just drop it in there, man. So makes it easy because email sometimes doesn't let things happen because of sizes and stuff like that. So I'll make sure you get it, <coughs> get it to me, okay? So with that said, now for our top <laughs> listening cities and our grinder video shout outs, we're going to start out with our First actual video, sh video shout outs right now. Oh, I almost said the wrong word, man. <laughs> hey, Elk Rose, my name is Brian Zakovec. I'm working up here in Colorado Springs, Colorado, but I live just south of here in Pueblo, Colorado. Pueblo was actually one of the top cities for consideration for Colorado State Capitol back in the 1880s. So a lot of history there. Uh, in fact, my wife's family has lived there for over 150 years. Hi, my name is Seth McPherson. I'm from Paducah, Kentucky. We're located at the confluence of the Tennessee and Ohio Rivers. Paducah, Kentucky is famous for being founded by William Clark of the famous Lewis and Clark Expeditions. How cool is that, man? That's cool, huh? man. Bet yeah. you Paducah, like it. Kentucky in the house. And I don't know if you guys remember <laughs> Seth. Colorado. Seth is the one that was hunting elk in Kentucky, remember? Yeah. He had that, yeah. that tag in Kentucky. So that's, that's way cool. Oh, wow. Way right. cool. So is, it, let's, is his last name Winkle? Way cool. Yeah, Seth Way Cool. No, <laughs> McPherson. <laughs> McPherson. Okay. McPherson. What if he's ain't kin to the McPherson Bow Company? You know, you? I razzed him about that. Man. Did you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He he thinks they ought to send him equipment, but you know how that goes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. I mean, look, they got they got plenty of it, huh? Yep. <laughs> so Gilbert, why don't you tell us about our top listening city, Joe? This week's top listening city is located north of Lake Winnebago and overlooks the Fox River in Wisconsin. This area was once occupied by the Ho-Chunk and the uh, Menonimi <clears throat> natives uh, in the Minomini <laughs> language. <laughs> Boy, I can't get that out. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Minomini, yeah. Minomini language. Men the you area say that, is known you say that, as the... Akahome, or watches for them place, it says, in 1847, residents named the city after a philanthropist who donated $10,000 to build the city library. He never visited the city named after him in none other than Appleton, Wisconsin. Appleton, Ew. Wisconsin. Ew. <laughs> oh, yes. man, that was funny. Menomini. 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 Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I threw Gilbert under the bus. I usually ah, lead it out, and I was like, ah, no, me, ah, me. <laughs> ah, That sounds like some Middle Eastern. Sounds like yeah. Yeah. I got, sounds I like, got the, I got the whole like chunk. I can't get. That. I, I could you do that. He would have. He, he would have messed me up just with philanthropist. That's I would have stumbled over that one. Oh man! Well, you know, could you? I mean, God, if somebody named a city after me, I think I'd visit it once, or twice. You yeah, know? like yeah. that. But I would have to. So, is this where the Winnebago name comes from? I have no clue, Joe. Huh? Don't know, but Lake Winnebago is Lake up there. Winnebago. That overlooks right. the Fox River, Joe. Huh. All right. All right. I guess so. Luis, up <laughs> next, so, baby. This city was once part of the Hudson Bay Company and is the original gateway to Mount Rainier. In an effort to make this area a recreational mecca on the east side of Spanaway Lake, the town was first named Lake Park. At least three rock bands, two local and one in New York mentions this city in its lyrics, Spanaway, Washington. Spanaway. We have so many Washington listeners, man. It's just man, they, the West Coast shows out. Oh, heck yeah, man. Especially and, and, up Northwest. Well, yeah. well, wait till you check this one out. And th this, uh, I remember yeah, boy, hearing a, a song the, about this one, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, the other end of the spectrum. On the other end. <laughs> 
This stopped listening area is a neighborhood in the New York borough of Brooklyn. It was founded in 1651 by Dutch colonists, named for the flat woodlands that grew in the area. The Battle of Long Island was fought here during the Revolutionary War. This borough was known as the City of Churches, Flatbush, New York. Flatbush, Flatbush, Flatbush. Flatbush. Absolutely. <laughs> Flatbush, New York. Flatbush, the other man. end of the spectrum. From the West Coast to the East the Coast. Coast. Was wow. it, wasn't there like something about some guys in leather, the something guys from Flatbush or something like that? That's Nunbush. Nunbush, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tina Turner. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. And then there was a store called, there was a shoe company named Nunbush back in the day. <laughs> My dad worked for him. <laughs> Come on, Gilbert. <laughs> Look it up, Joe. If I'm lying, I'm dying, son. Then you're lying, <laughs> son of a buck. I am not. Go look up Nunbush. N U N B. I'm on it. <laughs> Can't Nunbush resist. Shoes. All right, Cabez. Okay, and the final city, and it's located right in the middle of Elk Country, home to the secretive Manhattan Project. This secret city was off limits to the general population in the 1930s and 1940s. The atomic bomb that ended World War II, the focal point of the Manhattan Project, was created here. This city has the highest concentration of millionaires and PhDs in the United States, and that's Los Alamos, New Mexico. Los Alamos, wow. New Mexico. Wow. Man. And Highest concentration of millionaires and doctors. Yeah, they live, live up on top of, uh, I mean, yeah. where the, the hills go up and it flattens out on top like a tabletop, and it, it's wow. also- That's like three mesas, yeah. Theta, yeah. But, but uh, the Via Caldera, probably uh, mm. one of the top elk places in, in the United States is located just just above it. Yeah. Wow. Right above it, man. I mean, it's just, uh, and uh, Los Alamos in New Mexico nationally ranked, and I don't I couldn't tell you how many times their teams have won state cross-country meets, man. They're just phenomenal. In fact, one of Chav's former runners coached at Los Alamos. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yep. It was yeah. pretty cool, man. And also, just a, a, another footnote: uh, the national labs own a lot of a lot of land up there, and there's a huge elk herd in there that never gets hunted. <laughs> of course, really? some of them might have might have three different antlers or, or five legs <laughs> from the radiation. radiation. <laughs> they got the green eyes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, Joe, yeah. it wouldn't be episode 101 if I didn't say a little parentheses here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just want to confirm, I d fact checked okay. uh, the, the shoe company and Mr. Beto is correct. It well, still okay. exists. So the point was, he says, if I'm lying, I'm dying, right? <laughs> from, from the moment we're born, we're dying, man. So, yeah, man, but listen, man, I was not lying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so appreciative we have our analytics guy in the house. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the our fact, checker. Facts, our fact checker. Fact checker. can always depend on him, man. All right. Um, so... Guys, tonight's topic, the goal of Elk Preseason Guide Series is to give you our tips. And remember, this is the Elk Bros Perspectives, how we do it. There are so many different people to listen to and different styles, different techniques. This is just what we're doing. We're not telling you it's the only way to do things. This is how we do it. But we're going to give you our tips to get things rolling in the right direction and then help you to have a plan. Basically, the what, the when, the where, and why, and how to hunt elk this year, developing that preseason plan, that thing, the, the stuff that's going to help you from now until September, October, November, right? That's, that's our goal. Now, and it... This, like, we're going to stop at a certain point tonight to make sure that we get some Elk Bros mailbox stuff in. So wherever we stop, we will continue next week with that as well. You know, Joe, one critical part of this series is going to be your input as well, the listener, and the questions that come to your mind Absolutely. about things that are that just aren't clear, you know. Yep. 
um, and, and we will include those in our mailbox. Um, those questions are huge. So you got to send them in at info at elkbros.com. Right? Absolutely, man, because there's things that we talk about, guys, that we might use terms. We might use um, different ways of explaining things that you don't quite get because we see things with a different perspective. We see things with an elk hunting perspective. And if you haven't been there to get that yet, yeah. you don't quite have it. And if you have we questions, speak in Greek. Yeah. yeah, man, just mm-hmm. pop it in, send it to info at elkbros.com. Okay, so part one. Guys, this is if you were asked to list preseason tips or areas of focus that would most help people improve their elk hunting opportunities or their chances to be successful, what to work on between now and those times when they hit the woods, what would those be? Well, Joe, I'm going to lead it off uh, for me, and I want guys to understand whether you're a new a uh, new elk hunter that you're just planning your first trip or whether you're a guy that's a seasoned vet like ourselves. For me, it's about every year me analyzing my failure points, what failed for me last year, you mm-hmm. know? And, and then analyzing that and then going through where they're no longer failure points at all. Uh, I think early on in my elk hunting career, we all, you know, we were so, I was so enamored with killing the bull, big bull. Uh, I, I, you know, I wanted to kill a six by six, uh, a big 300 plus inch bull. That's really what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to. <laughs> uh, so for me, understand, and you can go back in our elk hunting academy and you can go back in our elk hunting podcast and look at the anatomy of an elk. And when you understand how to finish and where to put that arrow or rifle or bullet or whatever that you're hunting with. When you understand how to really put these animals down, it, it, it changes the game uh, because they are such unbelievably gifted athlete athletes that you're hunting. You really don't understand that. You come from the South Texas brush country where we've hunted whitetails and yeah even hogs they just don't have that will to live like a bull elk does right uh when you understand and i don't know dude i chased a pig over at your place that had some (laughs) had some pretty good will man (laughs) yeah but they got places that you and i can't go or ain't willing to go right uh so you know under for me i hunted a couple of years before i ever killed a bull and i wounded a couple of them right? And it really was because I didn't understand where I felt pretty good about getting in front of them, uh, about getting to them. And then it's about finishing, getting your bow drawn back and letting the arrow go and knowing where it's going to go. I was, I'm a very good archer as far as I'm not tooting my own horn, but where I want the boat, where I want it to go, it's usually going to go. But it was not until I really understood and I watched my daughter kill a bull elk with a crossbow. Mm-hmm. It clued me into something. Right. And uh, that bull was dead in 13 seconds. And I was like, man, I'm going to start shooting my elk there every time I shoot one. And the streak is alive, man. And just about every one I shoot in that same spot. Right. So for me, number one was analyzing my, my failure parts, which the first few times that I was, I got an opportunity to make a shot. I didn't, I didn't connect in the right spots. Uh When I hit high, closer to the hump, got one long, the other one, I punched him right in the shoulder blade, which is never what you want to do there. So after I really understood the anatomy and failure points um, of my failures in, in before, and then of course the physical part of it, understanding that I needed to be in better physical shape to, to get in front, to make that happen, that changed the game for me. But I, I would say guys need to analyze what didn't go right for them last year, right? Absolutely. And, and then listen to this podcast because these guys are going to give you failure points like this year, my peep turning black on me and me not rotating my peep, right? Um, that does. That's not going to happen again next year because the next time I'm just going to aim six inches left because that's all I got to do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to have to worry about that ever again. But it was. It took me having to practice that, Joe. Right. You know. So for well, me, but from from your failure point, I'm watching a video of 
Manano hunting just this last weekend. The yeah. first thing I saw Manano doing was checking his peep. Rotate his peep. Absolutely. Yeah, that was the saw first that thing myself. Doing. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. he actually kissed, blessed the arrow, man. I watched that. That was cool. <laughs> Did you see? Uh, that was cool, bro. That was cool. I got to give my boy props. When he blessed the arrow, I went, Ooh, that peep. That pig is in trouble. Well, it's anointed. And, and, and you, you know what? I mean, I don't know what we could ever say a, 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 about that if he's done that with everyone because out of th this whole group of guys that are talking right now, the only person that I have not seen wound and lose uh, an elk is, Man is Manano. So, sure. uh, you know, he's been aces, man. So maybe we all need to start blessing those arrows before we send them I'm allowed to touch every one of mine and elk camp. I promise. <laughs> Bless them for me. Uh, oh, man. Hey, Father Carmine, you want to go hunt him? <laughs> so. Exactly. I, so for me, Joe, my anal analyzing my failure points from last year, uh, you know, for me, every year is about being in the best shape that I can be in. Fellas, round is a shape, but that's changing daily. Uh, you know, we will come in as, as – my foot feels good. I'm back to, you know, doing what I need to do. So, I'm elk are in trouble this year, Joe. How, how did everybody survive the holidays, man? Everybody huh? survived Everybody survived yeah. the holidays without the... Oh, no, man. I put on my holiday 20. So, <laughs> it's going to be good, Joe. Mama, mama like Santa Claus. She likes to fatten you up and everything. No, it really wasn't that bad. So, That's I'm, good. I'm ready to rock and roll. 2021 is going to be a great year. I'm sure Amen. our elk bros right here are fixing to hit y'all with some wisdom that uh, knock your socks off. So that's from Joe yeah. right there, man. What, uh, what we want if to I do. may, Joe, uh, Joe um, I would add uh, to Beto's opinion the word of uh, practice. To me, practice is a big, big uh improvement i mean of your your habits if you if you go out practice every single month at least once a month we have in texas the, the opportunity the, the privilege to hunt pigs every i mean year round so that's a big point in my opinion if you go out and practice and hunt probably couple of couple of uh, twice a month at least right uh, that that would put you in a good position i mean starting January to, you know, to to, to, to next season, uh, in in another huge. Uh... So what I want to point out though is something that you what I I want to just add to that because it doesn't matter if it's small game or if it's pigs <clears throat> or if yeah. it's 3D That's or right. yeah and and I I really encourage people to hunt small game and and there's a lot of great um, dinner fare out there in rabbits and squirrels and and different critters um that you can hunt uh that are small game that really because now you have something that's moving you have an animal that's given different angles there are things that you have to think about and one thing that i see when people practice only 3d or only flat target and and look i'm that's way better than nothing Not, right yeah okay yeah. absolutely but when that happens you don't have to think of any other thing but your shot you're mm -hmm. not worrying about the angles. angle you're right. not worrying about um that that target moving on you right so you know you have it's to gonna think, yeah I, I, let me tell you what when you were talking about pigs you know uh <laughs> i never i never realized until because i'd never hunted a pig man and i never really looked at them that much but they don't have a neck so for them to turn their head their whole body's moving the whole time man yeah. it's like if they want to go this way i mean they're their cuts. whole body turned yeah. oh my god Look, I, 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 I challenge people that if you've never hunted them they will make you such a a much better a live animal hunter because they are very, very, extremely difficult They're to jumpy get a clean and, shot. Yeah, oh, really man. hard. Yeah, really hard. unbelievable, and, and, man. Yeah, and and, and they're another, hard to kill. And another, uh, and another point that Beto just mentioned, I would like to uh, back it up. It's uh, the anatomy. Yeah. The anatomy. Know the anatomy of, of the animal. We, I mean, we have a horrible time. Uh, trying to to recover an animal after a, shot, a marginal shot and and 
after we really Understood. learn ab about the, the anatomy of the animal and the shot placement, I mean, our whole world change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really important too. I mean, if you oh, are absolutely. hunting a big game, <laughs> and you know, it's I was easier. just I was just talking to uh, one of our listeners today, and right away, um, he asked me a question. He says, "You know," he says, I, "I've looked at y'all's shot placement and stuff when when I look at your academy, and he's mm -hmm. like, there's a big debate going on, or people have <laughs> a different opinion about where you should shoot because you say mid body, and a lot of people are like lower third, mm -hmm. and." And, and I'm like, uh, I want you to understand something. We have, as coaches, we have different reasons for what we do. Um, if you shoot that lower third and you hit in that golden triangle, you absolutely oh, yeah. are going to put a fatal shot on that animal. Mm -hmm. But our goal is not just to put a fatal shot on the animal. It's to put that animal down, yes, as quick as possible, and to ensure recovery. And in order to do that, we want two holes. We want a blood trail. And as Luis saw this year, a very fatal shot, man. I mean, he punched through that shoulder on there. He got both lungs, but that critter left no blood because he hit that shoulder, snaps the arrow, no blood comes out. Had it not been for us really working at it to find that animal, that could have been a tough one right there. Yeah. And so what I want people to understand is, is our shot placement <laughs> It's not saying that other people's shot placement is not fatal, is not deadly. No, absolutely not. I mean, you hit that animal in the heart, there's a chance he's going to just blow blood all over the place. However, there is also the chance that if that leg's forward, that animal runs, and he shears that arrow, and you end up with that flap of skin, that they end up bleeding internally. And I, yeah. I'll tell you, man, yeah. even a, an animal that's hit there can run a ways before now, they go down. And, and I don't know it, it, that that shot placement applies to all animals, right? I mean, right. that's, that's oh, one no. thing that people need to understand as well. I mean, if you're, shoot, if you're hunting whitetail and it's a relatively long shot, and for whitetail, I'm talking about more than 30 yards or so, uh, you know, if you're looking for mid body, I mean, you're, you're putting yourself in a tough situation because those animals are yeah. quick and react quickly right. and they, they duck those arrows real quick. And then you're talking about really, you know, uh, but we're talking wanting... about elk and elk hunters, yeah, right? Yeah, we so, are, correct. We yeah. are. And, and, and look, I want to tell y'all something, you know, my young son, uh, master Logan has become an assassin. I watched him put a white tail down this year, th this weekend in less than 13 seconds, Joe. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 13 seconds. He was feet up dead. Yeah. Right? I saw, yeah. I saw and the video he shot him a little high of center behind the crease, about five inches. And that deer was dead. It just same place. We shoot him. At, yeah. Uh, but way I mean, closer, right? Like, yeah. It was mm -hmm. close, close shot. I mean, for a wide tail for 24 yards. Yeah. Yeah. 24 yeah. yards. But even, even at 24, those critters can duck quite a bit. Yeah. If they're he did. Yeah. He did. If you look yeah. in the video, he did duck. Yeah. You no. Know? So absolutely. we have to we have to allow for that, but mm -hmm. understanding that anatomy and where that ganglia of big vessels are through the lungs mm -hmm. is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And My, mostly to the front of yeah. the lungs. And the, and the difference between and you guys the difference between a white tail and a and an elk is an elk is going to spin. Yeah. Uh, I've I've never had an elk axis. duck anything. They turn and spin yeah. off of it. Spin. So yeah. Uh, they change that angle just a little bit when it happens. Like That's that. why it's so important for you to understand the anatomy and the angle that you're making the shot at with both a rifle and with a, a bow. Yeah, right. So our shot recommendations, guys, when we give you those are to, like we said, to try to ensure that you recover that animal. And, you know, when we have put those shots on, uh, man, I tell you, the recovery <laughs> and the drop is man. fast. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, you do it's not have to recovery. shoot an elk in the heart to drop them within 10 or 15 seconds. Mm -mm. You know, Chab, how, how soon do you, how fast do you think Gilbert's bull last year fell? Oh, just like that. <laughs> not very <laughs> long. I mean, it's, it's real consistent recovery when you get the, the two holes. Yeah. The only yeah. elk I've seen drop faster is... Uh, uh, one shot, uh, uh, took a shot to hit the jugular. Oh, yeah, and that's right. Very far. But that's not a good place to aim. It just happened yeah. to move on. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, if you want a consistent recovery of your elk, you know, that's the place to hit them. Yeah. You know. Absolutely, man. So what other, what other um, 
Luis, what, what other what other focus area you got, Luis? Grinders tuning in, thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast. Our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our Base Camp Elk Hunting Training Camp the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our base camp training camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And base camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing To help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing and achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. And I, I honestly think that, again, when I think of elk hunting, I think of a journey. And I think we're all in different phases of that journey. And, and so your off season or your preparation season to me has to, it depends on where you're at on that, that journey. Um, and what are the things that, and, and like you mentioned, you mentioned, hey, beginners or vets, right? Yeah. But I mean, there's a whole gambit of in between that, 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 everybody may be different in what they need to work on. You know, sure. I'm at a phase right now where I think calling is probably the one thing that I need to invest a bit more time on. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I was a fa- at a phase last year, what I felt like, you know, shot placement and conditioning uh, needed to be something that I needed to concentrate on. And, you know, every year I realize there's something different. Like you're saying, you evaluate your, your failure points from the previous years. And look, and if you're not, if you're, if you're a brand new to this and you you haven't been out on the woods yet, I mean, I hope that the previous 100 episodes help you kind of prioritize what are the things that you need to work on. But we've always said it, you cannot go out to the woods unprepared and the time to do it is now and not a couple of weeks before the hunt because i went through a situation they, you guys know me i try to prepare way ahead of time and i try to like be very thorough with my equipment <laughs> very too thorough. much for my taste yeah. so i i realized i realized because of manano's taste i tried a new set of veins that were terrible <laughs> and no, thanks uh, me <laughs> and, and and just a little disclosure you know, no. manano's uh, all manano's arrows are built by me so i just i just want to put that out there right all right so anyway that's why y'all were both having difficulty <laughs> that's right so, <laughs> we were both having that same problem and yeah. it, it came down to be because of the veins well that let me to really dig into the engineering behind the behind the arrows and so this in the last two weeks it was kind of learning what were the things that i could do to last minute try to fix the, my arrow flight and that led me to realize that i had a limb that was cracked so that i had to change the bow and so 
all those things happened last minute. And trust me, I was not happy. Manano went to camp with the arrows I built for him. And, and, and let me say this, Luis. I, I spent three entire days, days. in the pro shop mm -hmm. turning up my bow, and, and, and they couldn't. And they were veterans. Yep. I mean, they, they, they couldn't turn up my bow. My, it was well, horrible. that's because somebody built your arrows and <laughs> so that they couldn't be sued. Yeah. Let me ask so, you, I was like, I'm going to do did this special arrows go for Manano. Yeah, did you, but, but did it, either it, one of you go grab a stock arrow off the shelf and shoot it through your bow? Oh, I tried. I went. I had yeah. to go back to the original, to the original setup. The original setup that we used to have before making any changes was what worked out. But we had to knock tune the arrows to make them fly better. Oh. So, I mean, that's that's where I got into the weight of the arrow, right. the FOC. speed, the, you know, and all that stuff. And then realizing, FOC. hey, man, I'm I'm we're borderline here to something that may not work. Uh, and I I want to go to elk camp. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we got to elk camp. We, we were comfortable with the arrows that we had. Manano shot them there. We said, we're good. That was kind of done. But then guess what? As soon as I got back, that was my, what I concentrated on. I concentrated yeah. actually on three things. Um, how do I need to build my arrows to where my arrows are effective and they fly true uh, with and without fletchings? Um, I also uh, invested in a nose button. And uh, because when I started hunting pigs at night, I realized that my anchor, anchor point, yeah, you lose it really easy when everything is dark. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, so that's helped me a ton. And then learning from everybody, because you not only learn from your failure points, but if you're blessed to hunt with a group of guys like we do, you learn from others as well of what they went through. So I was talking to, to you know Gilbert about his incident with the with the peep turning on him and I started looking online and found this company called Total Peep and they actually sell um, uh, a peep that's got a shape it's kind of like a glass right. clock yeah. and so it, even if it turns a little bit you still get the full circle on that right. peep mm -hmm. so order a few of those to try them out right and uh, so I installed it on my bow and so far it's works it's worked really good so trying new broadheads um yeah, I, i'm in the process of trying that so again it just depends of where you are in your journey uh this year for me has been mainly those things and obviously continuing the conditioning because i also learned that as i slow down on my training after the hunt mm -hmm. it was brutal to get back up in shape the three <laughs> months prior to the hunt yeah. so yeah. i'm like i don't want to go through that again as much as i hate yeah. working out I'd rather just maintain that pace so it doesn't feel as brutal as it did last year trying to get back in shape. Yeah. So I, I want to I want to take you back to where you were talking about your journey though because see that you have some mitigating circumstances because you said your journey in the beginning was all about shot placement. Um, you didn't worry about calling elk. Well, one of the reasons you didn't do that is because you had somebody calling elk. For Absolutely. You. Right. So the the one thing that for you guys in your preseason and and keep listening and let's all keep in mind what we're talking about here we're talking about what can these guys what areas and what should they work on from now until september that's going to give them what and the word is opportunities right so elk hunting is all about opportunities you, there's no way you can kill an elk if you don't have an opportunity or an encounter with an elk. Yep. So there's two ways that you can get an opportunity with elk or an encounter. One is to be in the right place at the right time, stumble into it. Uh, so I guess there's more than two. Uh, uh, another one would be that you could get some place and put yourself in a place that you hope those animals are going to go so that you can oh, have at a water hole, at a feeding area, um, uh, someplace that they're crossing a saddle at a certain time. So you can put yourself in positions and wait and hope that that animal comes through there. So you either got dumbing on one or waiting on the animal, or your third option is to create your opportunities. And to me, consistent. Now success, you can have success with any of these. You can have success with any of these. But consistent success are people that are going to create more opportunities because you're going to have opportunities that are going to be blown. 
They're, oh, they're, sure. they're going to be blown. So the more opportunities you have, the higher your percentage rate of finishing is going to is going to be able to be right. Um, yeah. I absolutely agree with what you're saying, Joe. I mean, yeah. I think calling needs to be up there, top of the list and priorities Huge, of things to yes. learn, trying to get out there. <laughs> uh, we were just spoiled, right, to have you and not really having to worry about yeah. the calling until you and as yeah. as we start started moving on, we realized like, hey. This is something that, as you mentioned it, you know, the, the, the whole team is going to be as good as the weakest link. And Absolutely. so we all need to be brought up to that level in order to, for the whole team to perform. So that's when I started realizing, hey, you this sure is something do. I need to work on for sure. Well, and I think everybody realized that. I mean, the, the day that, uh, you know, we had to leave and take Chav down to the uh, hospital, yeah. um, it was like, hey. Um, no sweat. You're going to have to start calling, man. That's, yeah, man. that's all there oh, is. There was sweat. Get her done. <laughs> <laughs> like that. So yeah. I'm sure Brendan was like, what, I'm not going with Joe first thing? I'm like, no, buddy, you stuck with me. <laughs> and he, then he saw me call that bull back seven times, and he was like, dang, dude, you got really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, but dang, bro, that was awesome. It changes the game, man. And, and yeah. I'm going to tell everybody out there, listen to me. The reason that we have so much success punching tags is because we're able to create, create opportunities because we can speak the language. Not only can we speak it, we understand situational things with elk. And, and I think that's the toughest thing for a lot of people is they do not understand like, okay, an elk just did this. Well, how do I react to it? Right. You know, so they don't understand what's going on in the situation. That's why most people watch all these videos of people that, you know, scream at a bull, bull screams back, comes in, eyes just, you know, bugging out of their head, drooling and everything and killing an it's animal at five or ten yards. Right. <laughs> hey, and, Joe, big, big thing, big tip. Guys, go to the base camp. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you want to do something that's going to help you between now and September? Go to the base camp. Well, you so, can learn how to speak the language. So there, here's here's the thing that uh, if we were to take that, and thank you, Gilbert, for saying that, and I appreciate anybody else who said it, and we've, we've had a lot of people that have been very complimentary, but at the bottom line in that is your knowledge. Yeah. Bottom line is your knowledge. Yeah, increasing the base of your knowledge about uh, I mean, elk and elk hunting and calling. And elk I mean, behavior yeah. and... You know the whys of why they Student call the, the different sounds. And, yeah, the uh, calling. The calling is part of that knowledge. I mean, oh understand. Absolutely, huge. man. It is so critical because I'll tell you, in all of the years of mine and Chad's success, it has to do with being able to call elk in and yeah. and creating opportunities. And mm -hmm. understand something: when we say calling elk in, that doesn't mean that <laughs> they're screaming at us when they come mm. in. Right. No, I, you know, again, it's communicating for sure, communicating or responding, or yeah, responding, or responding you know, in I, some I, way. I harken back to a little opportunity Chav and I had where we were up against a barrier and man, we, I mean, it was crazy what we had to go through, you know, but because I understood the, the language of that bachelor group of elk, I was able to keep them from blowing up and they were 12 feet from us at one time, Jeff, oh, I mean, yeah, and caught our wind. They knew something wasn't right. And because I could throw calls behind me, softly cow call, I sparked their interest to where one of them, actually two of them made the fatal mistake of getting in an angle at a distance that I was, comfortable with a long distance too but i was very comfortable with but that would have never happened had i not been able to at least speak the language and understand the situation and i couldn't have done that you know that was three years ago i couldn't have done that you know my first two or three years in you know uh, and, and look having chav with you is like having that you know that angel the on your shoulder yeah the yoda ninjas with you man yoda can but Chad couldn't say a Chad couldn't say a word because I mean they were they were right there eyeballs on us the whole night. It's just and they're getting ready to jet any minute, and I'm calling them back. And 
man, he's, I can hear him going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what you need to do, you know, and then when they pre- presented the shot, I didn't even have my range find. I'd already handed it to him, and he's clicking away, clicking away. He tells me, like, 19 yards, and I'm, I look at him, I'm like, that, that rascal's at least 60, you know? <laughs> and then finally he goes, like, 57 or something like that. I'm like, that's it, you know, and que sera, sera, I mean, but I would have never been able to do that had I not been able to speak the language and understand what that little herd of bachelor groups wanted. They sure as heck didn't want some big nasty bull screaming at them, yeah. you know, because that had just scared the hell out of them. But Well, and, and that's the other thing. Like, for example, most people mm-hmm. will not understand that, um, for example, when you have an elk coming in within a certain distance, you never want to call forward at that elk, yeah, um, right, yeah. especially with with the bat style grunt tubes that sound awesome. They sound yeah. great. Uh, they they reverb. They do really good on that. But the the only issue in form factor and they're and they're fantastic for team calling. You know mm-hmm. when you get to be back behind somebody because you don't have to worry about. But if you are anywhere where you need to keep eyes on, if you're a solo shooter or if you're if you're on the shoulder as a guide even, you know, of somebody or you're on the shoulder as a partner where you're trying to see everything that you know, I never want to call forward at an animal because think about this. Why is an elk coming into you? They're coming in because they want to see another, another elk, elk yeah. right? Yeah. So when they hear that sound coming at them, they are amazing at pinpointing sound and judging where that animal should be. And when you call straight at them, you're given the um, allure. Your position away. Yeah, and, and you're given the illusion that you're more further ahead than what you actually are. So now an, they're an going to hang comes, up on you. They're going to hang up on you, man, especially if it is a visual area. So that's that knowledge right there. That's the knowledge that you're talking about, Luis, and, and the calling of knowing when and why and how. That is not only the calling in itself, being able to make the sounds, but adding the knowledge of when the, those come and when they're appropriate. Joe, would you would you rank? I mean, if if you were just kind of from scratch, mm-hmm. I mean, this is how I would rank it. But would would love y'all's input on this. You know, obviously, I think we all can agree that knowledge is number one. Um, at calling, definitely number two um, mm-hmm. with the knowledge. And in the knowledge, I would say, but animal behavior first, mm-hmm. and then area where you're hunting second. And now calling. And, and I would actually toss out the area where call. you're hunting, man. I would yeah, toss I it out. I, I, would, okay. I would understand what types of, it's kind of like, and we're going to talk about this. This is going to be one of our shows coming up that you hunt like a fisherman, you fish like a hunter. And, I, you 100%. know, Gilbert can go to a lake, a body of water, any lake, and by looking at how coves are, what the bottom's like, where the brush is. He knows where to go and catch fish because those are the fishy location. So that knowledge and understanding where what attracts elk, where elk like to hang out. The pattern of that time of year. Yeah, on on certain times of the year, right? Um, That's more important than knowing the area. So basically, Luis, if you understood where elk go, you have that knowledge or what they like, what they, what, where they want to be, what their cover is, what their feet is, how they need to be at water. Yeah, if you get the knowledge when you get to the area, you can now translate that into, into Absolutely. helping you out. I follow you. Absolutely. So, and, then, and then after that, so obviously that's core, right? Mm-hmm. But then after that, hey, you know, make sure you understand and know and rely on your equipment. And then I would say then after that, make sure you, you – where did the calling come in in your, your list? Phys- oh, so the calling was right below the knowledge. Okay. So, so, so and, right, and, a, right, a, kind of on the same n- calling is kind of part of the knowledge the way I see So it. the thing I want to say please. about that is here, here's the deal on calling and knowledge, right? Uh, you could get super at your calling and you can have animals in and you're going to gain knowledge year after year after year. Oh, I right? got you. Okay. Yeah, I see so, what you're so you're going to sure. gain that knowledge and, and you might have some opportunities, but a lot of them could be blown because, or you're not sure what you're doing yeah, when you're the calling. The calling is going to help right? you learn more about the animal. I guess, right. Is, but is, yeah. absolutely. But, but if you gain the, the knowledge, 
you gain that knowledge and become really good at calling while you're learning that knowledge. Now what you're doing is, is you're cutting that total learning curve and those years of being successful because you're not, and you're going to still get stumped anyway. It's dynamic, oh, yeah. man. It's part elk of hunting, it. We right? all do. Yeah. yeah, it's part of elk hunting. But you eliminate a lot of that learning curve by becoming a super caller, but understanding why you're calling, what the animal behavior is, that in itself right there is so, so key. Important. And it's so important, man, yeah. because, you know, I, I can have my gear that's not doing really good like Luis and Manana was and get an animal at 12 yards and we don't have to worry. We just shoot it, right? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. won't like to think that way, but, you know, it, yeah. it messes with you mentally for sure. Man, yeah, absolutely, look, I, man. I, I agree. <laughs> I, you know, for for me, the calling part is right there below the knowledge, you know, and then for and, and again for me it's about understanding the critter you know understanding his his tendencies and then his anatomy yeah uh, and that's that because you got it yeah man. you you got to finish you that's know? knowledge uh definitely 100 percent. i'd like to hear from the elk ninja what he would think that one of his be biggest things for preparation from off time to go time would be so chav can you give us one little tidbit from the elk ninja to, to our listeners out there. Well, I'll give you a couple of uh, <laughs> uh, Just going back to, get to what you guys are talking about, you know, knowledge is so important because you can call, there's people out there that call really good, but they don't understand why they're calling or they don't understand the situation, you know, when to use the right call. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like Joe and I coached track forever, it seemed like, <laughs> and we always attended clinics. You know, we'd go and listen to a, an expert coach uh, talk, uh, you know, with different coaches, you know, five hours a day for a week. And after the week was over, if we had a chance to pick up just one little nugget, you know, that was enough to get our knowledge even higher. Oh, yeah. And, and it, it would help us out during the season. That's the same thing with uh, elk hunting. If you have a chance to just acquire more knowledge, do it. And there's all kinds of ways, you know, the podcasts, our podcast, you know, uh, there's a lot of podcasts out there that are really good. And next week, uh, I'm going to give that list. Yeah, yeah videos and uh, just even reading. Base camp. I mean, there's, and then just talking to other hunters, you know, just try and gain more knowledge because there are people out there that I know are, are good callers. They just don't know what situation to use, what call. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, they're not all going to come in after you. There's a certain call for every situation, and that's what you got to do. And then going back to what uh, I think Luis started earlier, was talking about getting getting in shape. You know, uh, to me, uh, it's just like a marathon. Start off slowly, and if you start off slowly and, and just build towards the end, uh, there's less risk of injury that way. Now, for me, it's going to be an ultra marathon because I, I think I have about 50 to 60 percent feeling back in my legs. So I still have a ways to go, you know, with that and balance. So I've already started and, you know, whether I get there or not remains to be seen, but, you know, just start off slowly and, and build on it. Uh, Cause like, uh, you know, we used to have a saying when we were coaching track is uh, you, it takes you two weeks to get, well, let's say it takes you two months to get in shape and it takes you two days of doing nothing to get out of shape. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I agree. You know, you know, so, you know, get a consistent training program of some type to, to get in shape. Yep. Yeah. And uh, fantastic stuff yeah, for you, for you guys out there, you know, when it comes to gaining knowledge, man, um, there, there are so many resources that, yeah, we have our base camp, but Corey Jacobson has elk 101. You've got the elk collective with mm -hmm. Dirk Durham out there. Um, you got the elk calling Academy with Michael Batiste, who's phenomenal out there. You've got the elk nut app. Um, uh, that you can go on to. In fact, um, got, <laughs> got, got Game University 
um, ha, do, they do their own podcast, which is basically is is Paul talking with other hunters or, or Paul talking about his stuff. And if you yeah. if you're not listening to Paul, man, Paul is a total grinder, and he's somebody that I, I, we relate so well to Paul because it's it's like that kind of like parallel universe in different parts of the country, man. How <laughs> how things were done. So I have a lot of respect for him and and how he does things. You know the podcast Western Contours. Um, is, you know, guy is tremendous. The Western Huntsman, if you go to the Western Huntsman, he did a school of September, and Jim Huntsman has just come out of the gate just swinging, man, doing incredible stuff. Backcountry Rookies with Chad Riker, Elk Talk, Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson out there, Elk Shape, you can listen to Elk Shape out there as well. Um, Trent uh, Fisher, born and raised. Yeah, born and raised out there, on point with Garrett. And, I mean, uh, these these are all great resources and you can actually what's great about it's like a buffet you can go on there and you can look and and if you're hunting elk you can find their pieces where they're talking to people about elk hunting man and and go listen to it because like chad said there's a nugget in everything man so um what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and and we're going to end this part and we're going to come back in here because there's still some parts that we can talk about here and i want each one of you guys to think about what we've talked about you know because remember it's about helping people to gain opportunities right so um what other things can they be working on and i think you know as we go in this we're going to take some of these areas and and expand on them we'll expand a little bit on conditioning we'll expand on some of the knowledge we'll expand on some of the calling just a little bit but uh our whole goal is guys we want to help you and remember this coaches as we go through this we want to help them to be able to have a plan in other words you know what are they going to be working on from now to then and what what do they need to focus on without it being and that's another thing chav mentioned as as we're as coaches we want to keep it simple we won't don't want to unindate you so that or inundate you so that sometimes you forget about the artistry of it and it becomes more science. You try to overthink situations instead of letting it flow and instead of enjoying the moment and enjoying the hunt and feeling the animal and feeling the woods and things like that. So, you know, that's also part of it that we want to bring to it is, is, that, is that inner peace part and relating with what you're doing and not just going through and forcing your situation because I think it's the biggest problem with hunters. And we'll talk more about that mm-hmm. as we go. And uh, we'll go to the Elk Bros mailbox now. You guys uh, Real will, quick, will, Joe. Yeah. Uh, with, regards, with regards to conditioning, does air conditioning count? <laughs> <laughs> hey. Like I said, round is a shape. <laughs> when, when you're out in the woods, it's always air conditioned, man. Oh, I got you, man. Unless you're walking behind Joe. <laughs> he likes to walk in circles. <laughs> That's to get the air flowing, too. Gilbert. That's and we did we flowing. did that to a friend of ours the other day. <laughs> no, no, really. no, he was on the phone, and we kept on going in circles and circles, and he was just kept on going. Man, Manano and I were on the floor rolling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're talking too. short. We're talking short radius circles too. I mean, it's short <laughs> radius. I mean, it's just. I tried so many hilarious. times because yeah, Gilbert. So guys, you guys are listening we cut up all the time sometimes and gilbert was giving me a hard time and i was like i'm just gonna walk this son of a buck in circles man and see see if he catches on man and, and he, he, he's like take feel me. like a circle joe <laughs> that's geometry i know geometry joe i, passed. I cheated a little bit but i passed <laughs> all right elk bros mailbox here we go coming up first Okay, I got the first one, and, and uh, I'll give you my answer after I read the question. It's from David Draper from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. He says, I'm not a newcomer to hunting with a bow, but looking to hunt elk for the first time in 2021. I heard Gilbert talking about how you all shoot a hammer for a setup. Can you explain that? Will my deer setup be enough to hunt elk? If I get a pass through on deer, no, I if, oh, most if I do time. get a pass through on deer most of the time. And my answer is this, is four of the guys on this podcast shoot of what's called a hammer. And one shoots a rock. That would be me. <laughs> and I'll explain <laughs> what I mean by that. 
uh, Joe shoots a, 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 I guess a bare bone bow, best to describe it, and shoots with fingers. Uh, he has no sights or anything, but, but what he has in common with, with uh, Luis and Manano and Gilbert is they probably shoot a 70 to 80 pound draw, I guess, is that the correct term? Yeah. 70, yeah. I'll wait. So they can shoot, I mean, their arrows are just flying and, you know, their draw is, is pretty amazing. Of course, they're all great archers too. Uh, I shoot probably a, between a 55 and 60 pound draw myself. So that's why I say rock compared to a hammer. Uh, I think what Gilbert means by hammer is they're just real powerful bows. Uh, I'm not the sure. Dr I think. Our draw length is long, yeah. uh, but 31 inch draw. Uh, and, uh, so, yeah. yeah, didn't Gilbert, didn't... Uh, Carl Gamage call, call them atomic bows or something. Yeah, like nuclear bows. Bow. Nuclear, nuclear bows. That's nuclear. Right. So, nuclear bow. God dang nuclear uh, bows, man. man. <laughs> yeah. so he hated answer. them so bad he bought one. Yeah. Actually, that's Luis my answer. has it. If you guys want to want to add more to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, for me, a ham. I'd I'd really like to. David, send us what your setup is for white tails, and uh, we can tell you whether you know how it's going to hold up against. Uh, against elk and Luis can go into much more detail but I can tell you that if your draw length is 28 to 30 inches and you're shooting 60 plus pounds you shoot a cut on contact broadhead with a good heavy arrow you're gonna be just fine brother amen to that and and I like to nudge guys man to that 65 pounds man if you can if you can without breaking form um, and breaking down and you're able to draw sitting down or in different positions um, then uh, and you can do that at 65 pounds uh, I, I highly encourage that on elk uh, yeah I, I agree I mean I think I you described it perfectly there uh, Gilbert I mean if you got a setup like that you shouldn't have any issues but I'm with Gilbert uh, reach out to us more than glad yeah. send us your phone number man we'll call you i love talking about that stuff yeah. I mean, you're not the first person that i geek it out over the phone and talk about it so yeah we're uh, accessible so fellas man you, if you'll email us we'll give you our phone number yeah. and we can talk about it i'm much yeah, i'm much better on the phone than i am tickety typing our way on the computer. oh yeah yeah and also you know a with the one concern i see on this here is like uh, get pass throughs on deer most of the time that most of the time kind of worries me a little bit because you know with a setup like the one gilbert described you should you should Easy. get pass throughs through deer every time even if you hit bone yeah. so I, I just that's my kind of experience with our current setup uh <laughs> Most guys that tell me that lend me to believe they're shooting mechanical broadheads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and 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 that's one thing, David, that we try to shy away from is mechanical broadheads with elk. For deer, you know, uh, if it works for you, it's great. But for elk, um, that again, that's another one of those failure points that we like to eliminate. And you know, when he's talking about a hammer, he's talking about bows that have such good kinetic energy, such power on them that. You know, you can hit basic. I hit a leg on the other side of an elk. I actually entered in on one side, hit the leg on the other side, the leg bone, and shattered it, man, on the other side, which is unbelievable on elk. You know, Luis um, shot his elk this year, goes through the shoulder, goes through the shoulder where you don't want to be, and actually, you know, punch through it. It, it makes for a tough recovery, yeah. but, you know. And some of the things that I've been looking into is exactly that. I mean, really, importance between kinetic energy and momentum. And right. what's more important? You know, kinetic energy tells you about the 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 speed and 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 how that energy is is it's translated is coming right. out of your bow. Right. But your momentum. Think about the momentum is how that energy it, it, it release translated on the impact into the animal. Yeah. So, which is kind of more important. So, absolutely, uh, definitely, they kind of go hand in hand. But at the end of the day, really, what you should concentrate on is momentum. If you want a full pass through two holes, and that's what we want. And David, I can tell you what I've watched videos of these guys shooting deer, and the arrow never stops. I'm seeing it <laughs> actually ricochet on the other side of the deer. You know, hitting and going off other areas. So. Um, that's what they mean by a hammer. Now, so next up, Brian Smith. Next up, uh, this is going to be me. Brian Smith from Woodland Park, Colorado. 
He said, hey, hey guys, how much do, do you worry about broadhead tuning? What <laughs> kind do you guys like to use? Are there Love it, man. I'm loving these models questions, bro. Or models <laughs> require less worry? So this is a... This is a good question. Yes, well, yes, yes. And we just got done talking about a lot of that with yeah. you guys coming into camp, right? And 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 what I'm going to tell you, Brian, is do me a favor, man, so that we're not here for another hour and a half on this. Uh, <laughs> you, you you need to call him. You need to call Luis, man, because uh, write him a letter and yeah. and send your phone number. And dude, let me tell you what. Uh, I, I, let me tell you how much Joe Gillia worries about broadhead tuning. I, I don't. <laughs> And but now on the other end of the spectrum, we have Luis, right? And I look down my arrows when I shoot. I see my flight, and if I like my flight, my arrows are good. And I under, I'm kind of like the um, uh, Larry Bird of archery. You know, Larry Bird had the ugliest shot there was in the world, but you couldn't stop it, man. <laughs> he shot it so much that. Like I always tell everybody, man, if if you got a setup that works for you, right. And you don't want to worry about hand loading like I do. I hand load my own arrows. Yeah. Then, then you're good to go, man. It's it works if you've proven it. But now, if you got something that you're not very sure about, and you don't think it's working good for you, and you want to, you know, dig into deeper into all these different tuning, uh, there's plenty of things that you can do, and I'm way super glad to so, help. So to do so to do something for Brian real quick. Man, look, we, we I don't worry about I don't worry about broadhead tuning, but what I do is I stay away from mechanicals. Yeah. And I stay with fixed bed, fixed blade broadheads. Wasp Pavlon, really good broadhead, shot it, shot a pig with it just this last week. Fantastic head. Man, and I'm telling you what, my son shoots nothing but muzzy trocars. An unbelievable fixed head broadhead that flies like a field point at extreme distance. I've been so pleased with its performance. And then, of course, I shoot the blood sport. I guess it's the reckoning now. Is that yeah, right? reckoning? Yeah. Yeah. So are, are they still uh, producing three. that blood sport? I, I, I you can still them. find you can still find them on Amazon, but you uh, you can't find them on their website. Yeah, I don't but think they're, they're producing them. I think they're just out there. What's left, you yeah. know? So, so Terry Hartcraft built that broadhead here in Fredericksburg, Texas, and sold it to Pradco, yeah. and they've designed they've made some iteration designs and this that and the other. So I have been forced to try and and, and look at other broadheads. There's two that I'm shooting. And one's the Wasp Pavlon. The other one is the uh, Muzzy Trocar. And I've shot the G5 Striker for a long time, man. So and you, those you three broadheads, you can never go wrong. really good, too. You, you and, talk and, about hammers. I've been shooting the Wasp Hammer and uh, the Wasp yeah. Boss. I've been shooting Wasp for 30-plus years. So I've never shot a different broadhead. They've always worked for me. I, I'm, You know, uh, I've... My wife and I are getting ready to celebrate our 39th uh, anniversary. When I find something that works, I stick with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and Brian, we're not. And Brian, we're not sponsored by a broadhead company. So Absolutely we're not. not, man. And 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 real quick, my last point take on this, Brian, is one. You know, feel free to call me anytime. I do worry about broadhead tuning. Um, I I tune them with the inserts, Brian, to glue in the inserts, and two. Uh, I've migrated to single bevel um, two blade broadheads that are heavy and heavy on the front on the arrows because I've, as I go through this, I've learned the importance of a heavy arrow with a forward center and an arrow that flies true after that's, the incident I had last that's year. That's Luis, L U I S, at elkbros.com. And Sir. Gilbert at elkbros.com. Got it's, no problem with telling you what we do, brother. Everybody up here is first name. You you know, yeah, you want yeah. uh, Joe is Joe at elkbros, Chab at elkbros, Manano, and which is not his God given name, but he is Manano to us. So. It is, um, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I wanted to get to this last one before we got yeah. out of here because yeah. uh, okay. I think it's always important to talk about things like this. Uh, so Josh Downard, um, go ahead and read that for us, Luis. Yeah. When you guys are talking about counting coup and pulling uh, on animals, I have not done this, but I have known, uh, but have known I could take the animal when it is in front of me. I have no problem with people doing this, and I am uh, sure you guys are doing it uh, with a legal animal in front of you. But I know a lot of beginners 
kids listen to these podcasts and every uh, and with every piece of equipment there is a chance of failure just like when you talk about wearing gloves when hunting with a rifle and possibly making a bad shot or premature discharge but my point here is do we need to point out to the elk bros community that you should never uh, be re ready to fire on a critter if you're not legal to take that animal. I have always been told don't point a weapon anything unless you intend to shoot and kill. And uh, I have I have had my release fail while pulling back practicing at camp and mid draw it released and let the arrow fly. For that I would hate for someone to pull back on an animal and count coup and something happen and take an animal illegally. You guys are the pros and the coaches, just not sure if I've missed anything on this topic. I'm getting my boy into hunting and I wouldn't want him to draw on an animal that he's not legal to take. Man, this is gold and I absolutely, I think um, I think this is an excellent clarification uh, and that uh, needs to be brought up if it was ever mis you know if it was ever misread or misunderstood. But yeah, and and I'll start out with that because I have basically you know I I, I have lived with a group of hunters that we always talked about counting coup on an animal. There's multiple ways to count coup on an animal. Right. And counting coup does not mean you have to draw on the animal. You can be close enough that you can do that. Have I drawn on animals and counting coup on them? I absolutely have. Was I licensed and had those animals that were illegal animals? Yes, they were. But here's the other difference. And one reason that I don't think about it and the reason I need to clarify is that I shoot fingers. I don't shoot a release. Um, my bow is, my string is not coming out of my hands unless I let that puppy go. There's not going to be that failure in that as well um, when, when I do that. And so I have drawn on animals that are legal animals that I decided not to take in there. Had I decided to take them, and sometimes I look at it like, hmm, you know, like that, and I've let down on that. Um, I For you guys with releases or people that... Um, uh, what I tell people is you can count coup with a rifle, man, with never oh, yeah. putting your finger on the trigger. You can yeah. put them in the scope and you can find that point with right. never having. Now, again, yes, you never want to aim at something. Now, and here's what I what I teach when I have a, a rifle hunter is your finger never goes on the trigger unless you are ready no time. Yeah. to kill something. Never. So Same thing with a release. Yeah, absolutely. And... You know, for you guys that are release archery shooters, you know, could you, and here's the problem, you could possibly pull back without an arrow on a bow to go through the drawing motion. However, you I risk the dry that. fire, man, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when, when you do something like That's that. That's like 101. Don't ever do that. Yeah. So, But make sure when you do pull your bow back, it is pointed at something that you don't mind shooting in case of an accidental discharge. Yeah, like that. But, you know, I, I really don't know how you guys handle that. I mean, when you have a release, I would imagine you're pulling back with never even having that hand close to it. For man. sure. Well, right. yeah, I'm, I'm a closed hand grip. All the knuckles go behind the All trigger. All the knuckles go behind the trigger. Uh, and, yeah, can many times. So when we're, but, uh, white tail, when we're white tail hunting, it is so important for your draw and – because we're really close quarters. So it's so important for your draw and your bow to be really quiet. So there's a lot of times that we will draw and count coup on the animal, or we just practice a smooth draw, right? Mm -hmm. A lot right. of times I'm not necessarily aiming at the animal, but I am, practicing I am draw. practicing that draw so it's smooth. So, you know, I, I have no problem with my bow making noises. Because there's a lot of times that little bow, you know, ask my nano, you know, you got a little shower curtain going on or something like that, man. You're going to hear it when you get, when you draw it, man. Or if, you know, if your bow's been dry fired before, it's going to have these little nuances where it's been creaks and cranks. And <laughs> well, and I've, like I have, I've, I've drawn several times. Again, I'm a finger guy. I don't worry about dry firing. I would have yeah. to, I would have to dry fire myself for it to happen. And, I've gone through the drawing motion because, again, like Gilbert, the whole reason that I, there's a couple reasons why I count coup. And 
One of those is, you know, I, I'm looking at an animal that I'm not going to take, and I'll pull back. But like he said, I get to find out if my what my draw motion, how the animal reacts to that. I get to find out if my equipment has any creaks, if my pack has any creaks. And, and yeah, you can do that kind of stuff when you practice, but it's so different when you've been out hiking in the hills and you haven't shot your bow for a long time, and you go to do something like that. So, uh, and, and you do not have to aim an arrow at an animal to practice your draw when you're doing that and still know that you could take that animal yeah and i've never i don't know that i've ever pointed it pointed my arrow or my barrel from my rifle mm -hmm. at an animal that i hadn't contemplated that i was going to take or not right, right. whether i was going to count coup on a cow or a bull i got a cow or bull tag uh same thing doe or you know buck tag uh so i guess if there were there was a malfunction and look i'm not saying that can't happen because i'm telling you i was privy to a, a malfunction while i was guiding and the guy draws his bow back in the blind and he accidentally hits the back of the blind when he draws and that prompted his finger to try and 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 react and, pull, and, boop, and he let that arrow go shot yeah. the deer through both flanks I mean, you know, it, it happens, you sure. know, so you got to really, uh, I, I think 100% right. You need to make yeah. sure that I, what's in front of you is something you intend to take or, you know, if I've, there is I've a counted, malfunction. I've counted coup just by getting up on an animal, yeah, uh, getting as gotcha. close as possible, knowing that I'd be able to take that animal. And I've even yeah. gone as far as you guys have heard it in some of my videos. I'll mm -hmm. get them up there and go, mm -hmm. dead yeah. Boy. Just like that. Yeah. So no, I think Mr. Donner has a, an excellent point, and for and sure. I, I, I I well taken. I, I honestly point appreciate taken. all this type of feedback because, yeah. again, I mean we we may look at it and think of it in a perspective that you know listener totally may be interpreting something different, and I think a yeah. clarification is due. And and, uh, and Josh, and, no, you're teaching guess, your boy right, man. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that you're teaching him the right and, thing. and we're real glad that you are saying that you're you know our our elk bros community is important and it's very important yeah, to us yes, and sure. we want to clarify things because we never want anybody to be in a bad situation yeah. you know and so that is something that all you guys got to think about out there is is you know there's lots of ways to do things safely and yep. there's ways to do things so that you know the situation and every situation is a, is a little bit different so we always want everybody to be legal safe and ensure that both the person and animal are safe in every situation yeah. you no, know this is gold thank you yeah fantastic questions joe 2021 is going to be epic y'all there's some really <laughs> cool things coming out with the mafia you know, we got the new series that are coming out. Joe is going to be really cool. You guys uh, stay tuned to what we got going on. Uh, Joe, you got anything to add before we close us out here this evening? No, you know, um, I didn't mention our, our uh, reviews. We got some tremendous reviews um, over the holidays. And, and, and guys, you know, for us, uh, when you guys take the time, because generally think about this in our society right now. Society is at the point where a lot of people don't want to take the time and tell people that they're doing a good job. Or, you know, we're real good at telling people when they do a bad job. Yeah. And and we don't mind you telling us either way. But we would really appreciate if you would give us, go into Apple Podcasts or um, you go uh, you can go into iTunes and you can give us reviews. And I believe even like um, um, there's another one of those out there that will Podbean or something like that that will let you give reviews and we really appreciate when you do that um, we spend a lot of time trying to do this for you we'd like to know if we're on the right track how we're doing if you're enjoying it if you are getting something positive out of it so um, please take the time if you can Go give us a review. Uh, subscribe right now to this podcast. Uh, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You know, check out what's happening with our Blue Collar Strong series. Uh, when you hear this, the this part two is either either out or it's out in the next few days. So stay tuned. That is awesome. Just a reminder, guys, if you guys uh, and our listeners, if y'all want one of your questions answered on our show, just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com. And like we say down here in the Lone Star State, husbands, kiss your wives. Wives, kiss your husbands. 
Hug your babies and keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Peace, peace, everybody. Oh.